connected. And because a few more people signed on, my name is Jamie Doherty. I'm the residential horticulture agent here in Lake County. And today we're just going to go over the basics of the nine Florida friendly landscape principles. And I'm really happy you guys are all here. Again, questions in the chat. You're welcome to ask them as we go. And I will also have a time for questions at the end. Oh, there we go. So our objectives for today are so that you all learn just the basics of the nine Florida friendly landscape principles and get some ideas of how you can implement them in your own landscapes. So let's start by talking about what is Florida friendly landscaping. So it's this integrative approach to maintain attractive, beautiful, and diverse habitats in your landscapes that are friendly to wildlife, conserve natural resources, and also help to conserve and protect our water resources as well. So we actually do have a Florida statute. It's Florida Statute 373.185, and it's legislation that actually defines what a Florida-friendly landscape is. Um, and it includes uh, quality landscapes that conserve water, protect the environment, and are adaptable to local conditions and are drought tolerant. Um, and if you are doing some of these principles already or really want to get into it after this, you can also apply through the Florida Friendly Landscape Program to have your lawn listed as an official Florida Friendly Landscape and get assigned for your yard. If that's something you're interested in, you can contact me and I'll get you in contact with the person to um, come and do the inspection. So landscapes are highly impactful for our environment. They take up a pretty big space um, in our ecosystems. We have this constant urbanization happening. So being mindful of what our landscapes do within the greater context is really important. So up to 60% of homeowner water use um, in Florida is for lawns and landscape irrigation. So we wanna make sure that we're using that water appropriately. Um, there was a recent study, it was a recent study that showed us that 60%. And our landscape practices impact our water qualities. We have runoff coming from our water sources that can impact our waterways. And then that can also impact property values, um, money that's coming into the state from tourism because water quality goes down. I think everybody's familiar with the red tide outbreaks that can happen. Um, and it's not just farmers that are contributing to that. There's actually things that are done in landscapes that do contribute to um, those algal blooms as well. And we'll be talking about those as we go through today. So what are those nine Florida friendly landscape principles? They're the right plant, right place, water efficiently, fertilize appropriately, mulch, attract wildlife, manage yard pests, recycle, reduce stormwater runoff, and protect the waterfront. And we're gonna be going over each of those one at a time. So your yard is that first line of defense in protecting Florida's really fragile ecosystem. So you can have a yard that is not only protecting our waterfront, but it's providing habitat and food for our wildlife in the state. And then you get to enjoy all of that. So first up is right plant, right place. And this is the cornerstone of the Florida Friendly Landscape Program. Um, and the idea here is that you have to determine what you have in your yard before you just start planting things. Um, a lot of times we have people come in, they are having trouble with their plants and they're not sure why. So there's a number of things that we'll do. And occasionally we find out that it's just not the right plant for the right place. And if you don't plant the right plant in the right place, you might end up spending a lot more time and money on fertilizing, watering, insect pest management, um, and the plant still might not make it just because maybe something else should have been planted there. So let's talk about what you can do for your site analysis to decide what you need to plant, like what's the right plant in the right place. So the first step is always soil. So you need to look at what kind of soil you have. In Florida, it's mostly some level of sand. You may still have a bit of silt or a bit of clay depending on where you are in the state of Florida. Up north, it gets to be more clay. Down south, it's a bit more sugar sand. And we're in the middle, so we get a bit of a mix. If you're more on the ridge, it's sugar sand. If you're a bit farther down, you might have a little bit more silt um, and a little bit more color to your soil. Now, one thing that's really important is the soil pH. 
Now, soil pH can actually impact a plant's ability to take up nutrients. So if you plant a, something in a pH that it doesn't like, it literally can't take up nutrients. So if you plant, let's say, a blueberry in a pH that's very alkaline, so maybe it's a six, seven, eight, you know, especially moving up to an eight, the blueberry literally can't pull up nutrients from the soil. So no matter how much fertilizer you put down, that blueberry is still going to die eventually. So this is a really easy thing to do when you're starting your landscaping or your gardening. Um, our office actually does free pH testing here. Um, if you need to do pH testing, that involves more of a nutrient analysis. It's a $10 test that goes up to the University of Florida. Um, and if you need help with that, you're always welcome to email me. Um, our pH tests in the office can take about a week to get back um, just because it depends on what our backlog is and how many volunteers we have in a given week in our plant clinic. Um, but that is a wonderful first step. Find out what the pH is, and then you let us know what you're thinking about planting, and then we can tell you if that's going to work or not. So the next um, thing that you want to look for in your landscape is look at drainage. So where are areas that you know that water accumulates or you have lots of water starting to run off and move around? So this picture actually has some blue lines on it, and this is an image that was sent to me by a homeowner who was asking you know, what to do about some drainage issues they were having. And I suggested considering installing things like a rain garden, especially in this one area that you can see on the left in this image um, by the house number. It's a great spot that you could potentially put in a rain garden to help collect that water so it doesn't just rush around and straight into a storm drain or into a lake. So paying attention to where you maybe have standing water in your yard, where you have particularly dry spots, those all will help determine what you can plant there. So if you have dry spots, you maybe wanna plant pines or upland plants. And if you have wet spots, you can plant things that grow um, better in wet areas and closer to the water. So another big one is light. And light's a little bit more complicated because you really need to check the areas in your yard multiple times a day to try to determine how long you have sun in a particular area. So is this area full sun? It gets sun basically from sunrise to sunset. Is it part shade? Is it full shade? And then how does that change throughout the day? Um, as you can see here, we have an area that currently you know, has mostly sun in one spot and we have shade. In the morning, this area is full sun, but then as it goes by, this back corner gets to be more and more shaded. So when you're thinking about where you wanna plant things, you do need to know the light level. Some plants do really well in part, part shade to even full shade and full sun. Some are really great no matter where you put them, and some are a lot more picky. If you're planting an edible garden, you want most of those to be in full sun. If you're planting caladiums and ferns or anything like that, you're going to want to look more into the shady areas. So it's good to check throughout the day. Um, and if you have anything like a ring camera or a um, security cameras around your property, it's handy because you can always go back and check and just look and see you know, what the sun looks like and you don't have to be there to look out your window every couple of hours. So some things in shade, if you have a shady spot, it can be really hard to figure out what to plant. Um, you can do things like Asiatic jasmine, mondo grass, lyrope grass, um, southern shield fern, and there's a lot more. Um, we do have our Gardening Solutions webpage that has lots of information on um, different things that you can plant in the shade. And if you have questions, you're welcome to email me and I can get you links to those. And my email will be available at the end of the presentation. So let's talk about hardscapes. So when you're talking about hardscapes and plants, you're looking at the house, the driveway, the sidewalk, fences, pools, anything like that. So when you're picking plants, remember these grow, and it's really important to know how large they're going to get when you put them in. So here we have an example of somebody um, planted a crepe myrtle literally right next to a house. And crepe myrtles actually get fairly large. So this isn't really a good spot. What's happened is by planting them this close to the house, you've forced yourself to have a higher maintenance schedule than if you had planted this farther away. More pruning is going to have to happen here. It's under the eaves, so it may or may not get enough water there, so you might end up having to have more water. And then you have issues with the roots potentially being impacted by um, 
the foundation and there's actually a driveway here. So it's in this corner. This plant just really needed to be moved about 20 feet away and it would have been perfectly fine. So when you're going through, think about, you know, it looks great now, but what's it gonna look like when it gets big? And that's something important when you're looking at other obstacles, particularly power lines. So if you live somewhere where there are power lines, I'm sure you've seen different pruning methods where the power company has to have clearance and that doesn't always work with the great aesthetics or even necessarily the long-term health of trees that are planted in the wrong place. So if you do have power lines in your um, within your property, some things to note is that you really shouldn't plant anything under them that grows taller than 12 feet. And that's gonna help prevent the need to have these really extreme pruning cuts. Um, and in this case, if you look at this picture, there's no reason these live oaks couldn't have been moved back so that they wouldn't have ever had a conflict with these power lines. Now, if you don't have a large lot line and you do have power lines and you do want to plant a tree, going with something with a V or vase shape is going to be better because it's going to prune easier and look more aesthetically pleasing once that pruning does take place. So our last big thing to think about when you're looking at site analysis is your climate. So in Lake County, we're in nine, zones 9A and 9B, depending on where you are in the county. And it's really important to make sure that what you're planting is good within those zones. So those zones are based on the average annual minimum winter temperature. So it's how cold these plants can handle. Um, and there are certain things, you know, if you're moving from up north, there's things that it's going to get too hot here. And if you're moving from down south, there's obviously things that it's going to get too cold here. Um, and, you know, there's certain things you can try and maybe they work, maybe they don't. An example would be starfruit or carambola. We're a little too far north for it, but they sometimes do well. We have one in our garden that does great, and I have two in my yard that are actually doing pretty good right now, too. Now, we do have a great website. I'm going to click on this and share it with you that you can use for more information about Florida-friendly landscaping. I just want to show you how this works. So you can go to our website, and you have Florida-friendly landscaping for homeowners that you can click on. Um, if you live in a community or know somebody that helps manage a community, and then even professionals. There are links to more information about each of the nine principles we're talking about today, but what I want to show you is your plant guide. So you can go on to your plant guide, and you're able to actually search for plants that may work in your particular area. So I have this set for um, the Eustis zip code. And what you can do is you can change that. Um, yeah, you can change the zip code by just going up here on the right and changing to whatever your zip code is. And it limits it. So you can do all of the plants in Florida, but that's quite overwhelming. So we can look at this. Um, what is V-shaped? OK, just notice that. I'm going to show you. So if we go into plant shapes, we can go down. And V is basically short for base shape. So we can go into base shape trees. And there were 24 trees. Now, this isn't limited to trees. It's also looking at kind of any plant that grows in more of that V type shape. Um, so sweet acacia is a smaller native tree that does get really pretty, very fragrant yellow flowers that is listed as a base shape or V shaped tree, which means that it's going to kind of come out on the sides more, and it's not going to be more like a lollipop, which is kind of when you're looking at laurel oaks or an oval shape like a live oak has. Uh, we can see a couple of other things on here. Um, bromeliads are a V shape. So if you think about a pineapple, a pineapple is a plant that grows in a V shape. Um, angel's trumpet, um, Chinese fringe tree, um, the native fringe trees as well. So you can look through here and see what might actually work for your area. So we can also go back, and if you're looking for, let's say, a, a tree, um, you can look at plant types, and maybe you're going into, you want a large tree, a medium tree, a small tree, if you're looking at turf grasses. I um, mean, you can see on the right-hand side, it gives you the number of different plants that are within each category. So this is a great resource. Um, it's relatively new to be available online like this. It used to be that you had to get books for all of this information. So this is um, quite friendly. And let me go ahead and I'm going to put this link in the chat for you guys. So you guys have that access afterwards. So that's to the whole plant.
page. And I'll also give you the this page here. And you can save those to look at them and play around with those a bit later. All right. Let's go ahead and wrap up right plant, right place. So when you're thinking about what you're planting, you do also want to try to keep it diverse. A monoculture, which would be just having one plant in an area, is actually more susceptible to pests and diseases because there's not enough variety of plants. So you're not going to get beneficial insects that could be predators. And if everything's the same, especially if it's genetically the same, if a pest or disease comes in, it's more easily um, going to wipe everything out. Um, and that's one of the concerns when you talk about to farmers where they are planting large monocultures, it can be a lot more labor intensive because of um, that susceptibility to pests and diseases. Having that variety of plants also lets you have different habitats that wildlife can use. So you might be able to create a habitat where you can have cardinals um, nesting in shrubs in your backyard. Maybe you have larger trees and you can get owls nesting as well. And um, you need shrubs and trees to even just have the lizards and you want those around so they can eat the bugs, right? So it's nice to keep different levels as you go through with your yard. So stuff that you have low, medium and taller uh, plants as well. So you can also use ground covers in areas where grass isn't going to grow. So grass doesn't like to grow in areas that don't get enough sun. So even shade tolerant grasses still need a substantial amount of sun every day. So if you have an area that's mostly to full shade, you're gonna wanna look at some of those alternative ground covers that I mentioned earlier. And remember when you're planting to always plant based on watering needs, you don't wanna plant you know, succulents right next to ferns because they have very different watering needs. Um, and if you water for the succulent, the fern will die. If you water for the fern, the succulent's going to die. So let's talk about a few tips and examples for this. Um, small strips of grass can be really difficult to maintain. So you can consider using other things. So for example, by this pool, you could, instead of having turf next to it, you could go with something like rock. You could go with an alternative ground cover. Um, you could even go with mulch. And I know most people with the pool aren't going to want to put mulch there because that could just blow right into the pool. Uh, but an alternative ground cover could look really nice there. And since it's full sun, something like sunshine mimosa, mimosa or perennial peanut could look really nice. Um, they stay relatively low to the ground. You can kind of trim them back with just even a weed eater, um, and they get really pretty flowers. So the perennial peanut gets a nice yellow flower and the sunshine mimosa gets a nice purple flower. So you wanna also avoid unnecessary curves and tight corners because it makes your management of the landscape a bit harder. So instead of doing something that's really tight, you could go with something like here where you have much more gentle curves um, or even in the very top right, they've opted to just completely mulch their yard and they don't even have to worry about grass at that point. And if you're looking for something like flipping your yard, here's a, one of the before and afters. So you have all of that turf and now we've switched it. We have this nice walkway. We have much less turf and every still you still have all that access to the shed in the back. I mean, if you're not familiar, there's a new TV show, Flip My Florida Yard where you can actually apply to have them come out and they will flip your yard similar to this, where they'll take an area that's mostly turf and switch it to a nice Florida friendly yard, um, like on the right hand side. And here is another example of that. Oh, wait, can you not see my presentation anymore? When did that happen? Hang on, let's... I still see Jamie's wind up. Yeah, is it okay? Okay, you can see it whole, okay, good. I, I glanced over for a second, I got worried. Is But everybody's okay? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and keep going. Does anybody have any questions before we move on to watering um, efficiently and effectively?
Looks like we're okay so More far. Questions. Wonderful. Thank you. Let's get this going again. So as I mentioned earlier, about 60% of residential water use um, and bill comes from irrigation systems in Florida. So you want to make sure that you're not wasting that, right? It's over half of your water use could potentially be coming from your irrigation. And preserving Florida's water quality is really important, and it's really one of the main missions of the Florida Friendly Landscape Program. And by watering effectively, that actually leads into reducing stormwater runoff that's coming later. So you can save a substantial amount of money by moving to the Florida Friendly Landscaping. So let's take a look at this, um, just looking at gallons of water. So on top, we've got a thousand square feet of grass and it's gonna require between 12,000 and 22,000 gallons of water for irrigation every year. Now, if we move down to the bottom where we've got more landscape beds, that same area, the same thousand square feet of landscape beds can conserve over 15,000 gallons of irrigation water a year. Because once you move to landscape beds, you're also going to be watering lower to the ground and you're losing less water to evaporation. And that brings us to when you should water. You should not be watering between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. So you wanna water before 10 a.m. and after 4 p.m. And that's because in the hottest part of the day, you can lose 40 to 60% of your water to evaporation from the sun. And if your water is actually spraying above your lawn, you're gonna lose that water before it ever even touches your lawn. So it's just a complete waste of water at that point. Um, it's always good to make sure that, you know, the winds are down and the temperatures are as cool as they can be during the day when you water to increase the amount of water that's actually getting to the plant roots, which is where you want it to go, right? Oh, sorry, got a little slow there for me. So another thing that you can do is you can actually install rain barrels to collect rainwater. And then you can use that to help with irrigation as well. Um, and something to remember is water when your lawn tells you it needs it. So we do have some great resources, again, on gardening solutions about the frequency of watering during different times of year for different turf. So some grass can go, you know, one to five days without water in the cooler months. And then some, you know, in the hot months, maybe you need to do them between three, every three and five days. Um, so it just depends on your particular lawn. You also wanna make sure that you check with your water management district and local regulations for when you're allowed to water because um, you know, as we hit the wet seasons and even there's always watering regulations, right? I don't personally water my yard, so I don't know what they are off the top of my head, um, but you always have to know, you know, if you're even or odd, there's different times that you can actually water based on where you live. Now, Florida's rainy season is from June to September, so we're coming into that. And it's really important to remember, if it rains, don't water your lawn. So you wanna make sure that you're set up so that if it rains, your irrigation system kicks off and that you don't water too much because if you actually water too much, it leads to other problems. So overwatering leads to fungal issues, weeds, shallow roots. It can stress out and kill plants because they're not getting enough oxygen into their root systems. And um, last year when we had really a lot of rain, people still, they had a lot of problems with um, fungus coming up in their yards um, and turf and even other plants dying from different fungal diseases. Um, and that was even with when they stopped irrigating just because there was that much rain. But it's always important to make sure that you're not irrigating. If it's raining, you shouldn't be irrigating. If it just rained, you shouldn't be irrigating. If you're expecting torrential downpours that week, you, you probably can hold off on irrigating until the rains come through um, and see if you actually need to. It's really good to have a rain gauge so you can see how much rain has fallen so you can determine if you still need to water or not. So if you're getting between an inch and two inches of rain, you really don't need to water. If you're getting much less than that, you might need to water a couple of things in your landscape. So moving on to fertilizing appropriately. So the, it's always good to do a soil test to find out if you need to fertilize. Um, just throwing fertilizer down for the sake of throwing fertilizer down can actually waste money and increase um, runoff of those um, nutrients into our water system, causing those algal blooms. So it's really important to, again, not just throw it on there because you, need, you feel like it needs it. Um, you want to do it when you know that it needs it. 
Um, the exception is palms. You do want to make sure you fertilize your palms at regular intervals because when they start to show signs that they need fertilizer, they really need the fertilizer at that point. So palms, you want to make sure that you get the slow release fertilizers on and keep it on on a regular basis. So you want to also make sure you're only applying fertilizer during growing season. So during the cooler months, most of our grasses stop growing. There's no point putting fertilizer on them. It's not going to do anything. And you want to use a broadcast sprayer with um, a deflector shield so that you're spreading it evenly when you actually do spread it. So when you're figuring out how much um, you need to put down, you can calculate your square feet by just multiplying, excuse me, length times width of the area that you're fertilizing. And you want to calculate that so you make sure that you put down the right amount of fertilizer. And I'm going to be showing you in the next slide what happens if you don't put down the right amount of fertilizer. Um, you, if you have new turf, 30 to 60 days, you don't want to fertilize as it gets established. And if you do the nutrient test with UF and it'll tell you what nutrients you need, you'll want to make sure that you're only buying the nutrients that you actually do need. Um, and we're also coming up to the point where we will have Lake County restrictions on the types of fertilizers that we can put down, particularly as it relates to nitrogen and um, phosphorus during the rainy seasons. The nice thing though is Florida soil is usually pretty high in phosphorus, so most of the time you don't need to add a ton of phosphorus. Um, a couple of tips for fertilizing. If you spill fertilizer in your lawn, make sure you clean it up. So sweep it up, you don't wanna leave it too much down there. If you leave a spill, like a large spill of fertilizer, um, especially if it's granular, you can pick it up. If you don't, you could burn your yard. If you're using liquid, you can't really pick it up, but you can try rinsing it out with water to try to reduce the chances of having um, a burn in your yard. Don't fertilize before heavy rain because everything's going to wash away and you never fertilize within 10 feet of any body of water. So again, to avoid that runoff going into the water systems. So over fertilizing can stimulate excess growth of your turf, but then also of um, algae in water bodies nearby. It can aggravate press problems. It can increase the need to water because you have your grass growing faster. Um, it can actually increase weeds as well, and then it can seep into our aquifer. Always make sure you're following the label guidelines on any um, chemical product that you're using, and you can also look at UF guidelines to help as well. So next, I'm going to show you what happens if you don't do it correctly. So on the left, somebody fertilized, but they didn't use a proper spreader that actually would spread everything out. So it all just fell where they were walking. And you can see they didn't really do a great coverage job. So you can see the areas that are bright green are the areas that they fertilized. And now the picture on the right hand side, we have one house with a bright green lawn and one house with a brown lawn. And what they did there is sometimes they, you know, you get a big bag of fertilizer and you put all of it down. Well, if you don't put it down at the rates recommended, you can end up burning your lawn and, and anything in your landscape and completely killing it. So you wanna make sure that you're applying based on the rates recommended on the packaging. So proper fertilizer practices, again, remember to always use the UF fertilizer recommendations and the label. Store your fertilizers in a cool, dry place. You want to keep them away from pesticides, fuel, and other solvents just to be safe. Never fertilize 10 feet from a water body. And um, when you're fertilizing, use a deflector shield. And again, read those labels. All right, next up, we're going to get into mulch. Mulch is wonderful. It does so many things. And um, when I talk about mulch, that in all these benefits, this is specifically when you're talking about bark mulch or pine mulch. If you're using rock as mulch or if you're using rubber mulch, most of these benefits um, go away. There are some benefits to rock mulch depending on where you are. Rubber mulch is great for playgrounds. It's not really great for your landscape. It doesn't provide any of the benefits that regular mulch does. So mulch helps to keep the soil warm in the winter, helps keep it cooler in the summer. It's going to reduce evaporation. It increases nutrients in the area because as it breaks down, it actually helps to feed your plants. You're going to reduce maintenance because a nice thick layer of mulch is going to prevent weeds. And um, yeah, mulch is just a wonderful thing. So how do you mulch? One of the biggest things I see, and I'm sure you guys see it too, is when they mulch around trees, tends to be where most of the problems come in. 
So you want two or three inches of mulch around most landscapes, okay? You have two or three inches of mulch, keeps the weeds down, you spread it out. If you have a woody plant, you wanna always make sure that the mulch stays away from the woody stem because it can increase the chances of rot and introduce fungus if it's touching the stem. So here we have two pictures of trees. We have a tree on the right that has what's referred to as a donut around it and a tree, oops, sorry, the left tree has the donut, the right tree has the volcano. So when you have a tree, for example, the point of a donut is to actually hold the water in that root ball that just got planted so that it can go down and those roots can become established. If you look at the volcano, if you were to water the volcano, all of the water is going to go away from the tree and not water it at all. So you never wanna do volcano mulching, but you do wanna do donut mulching on your new trees. So remember to always keep the mulch away from woody stems, okay? Now, when you're looking at mulch, you wanna avoid cypress mulch. You can't guarantee that it was actually um, harvested sustainably. Um, Melaleuca is a great mulch that you can use though because we don't want those trees around anyway. So they harvest those trees, chip them up, and it's a great way to help to reduce the issues that we have with Melaleuca in South Florida. Next up is attracting wildlife. And look at this cute little guy munching away on the leaves. So to attract wildlife, like I mentioned earlier, you need a variety of plants, right? You're gonna need host plants, you're gonna need habitat, you're gonna need places for different organisms to eat. Um, and having that variety will provide that. The, you want those layers. So again, low, medium, and high layers so that you can have different organisms being attracted. If you're looking for attracting pollinators, you want to have different flower types as well so that you attract more types of pollinators. Now, you don't need to plant anything specific to attract honeybees. Honeybees will go after any flower, but there are certain adaptations to poll for pollinators um, that are not honeybees, like our native bees, hummingbirds, butterflies. They have specific flowers that they're adapted to um, actually go with. You okay, Wanda? You're not muted. All right. Let's go ahead um, and keep going. So again, you want your habitats to have food, water, shelter, space. Um, this little guy used to be my neighbor at my old house back when I lived um, down in Lake Wales. I, his name was Lemon because that's the road I lived on and that's what I called him. So animals are only gonna reside and forage in areas with appropriate habitat. So something to consider too is if there are certain animals you definitely don't want, you don't wanna create that habitat for them. So you wanna you know, make sure that you're not making habitat for rats, you know, if you don't want the rats, but you can make habitat for you know, the birds. So water, for providing water, you're looking for drinking reproduction and birds also need a source to bathe for bird baths. Um, and there's several different things that you can do. Sometimes even just having a fountain that sounds like water will attract wildlife because they'll hear the water and they'll say, hey, let me go check out this area. It might be a good place to live or at least a good place to grab a drink. So again, that providing food. So here's an example of a honeybee that just doesn't care. So this particular flower is adapted for a hummingbird. Um, and that bee is just going to manage to do whatever it can to try to get in there and get what it wants. So honeybees aren't super particular. So some different types of foods you're going to be looking for is obviously flower for nectar, but you also have things that produce fruit, seeds, um, and things like that. And some of them, if you can get them where you can also eat the fruits and seeds, then you get a double benefit, right? You can harvest from them and then also the wildlife can benefit from them. And remember, it doesn't have to be native to be Florida friendly. All right, next up, manage your pests responsibly. And number one is be realistic. It's not realistic or practical to think that you're going to be able to have a 100% insect-free, weed-free, or disease-free landscape. You want to make sure that you're managing in a way that none of them become a problem. So I'm sure some of you have seen these little guys around lately, and they're getting bigger. So these are juvenile eastern lover grasshoppers, and 
Um, one of my Master Gardener volunteers um, had an amazing idea for managing them in our Discovery Garden this year, and we have been running with it ever since. Um, so what we've been doing is taking a shop back, putting, you know, taking out the filter, putting some soapy water inside it, and then walking around and vacuuming these guys up because their numbers are just so huge. There are sprays you can use when they're in the younger stage to kill these, um, but that most of the sprays that you can use on them are also going to harm pollinators. So you want to be careful on what you're doing. Um, but a nice, great um, new method that we were introduced to was that shop back in. Um, so far, everybody I've spoke to that's been using it has been really enjoying it. So let's talk a little bit about that integrated pest management. So these are basically ways that you can incorporate multiple different techniques to manage pests within your landscape. So number one is you're going to want to look at your plants relatively regularly. See if you see any signs of insect pests, diseases, discolorations. It's better to catch it early. It's a lot easier to manage early. Sometimes all that you need to do is take off an infected leaf, cut off an infected branch, and then you're all the way done. So you're going to want to start with that least toxic method because that's going to be what's most friendly for the Florida ecosystem. Spot treat. Don't just spray indiscriminately. And you should never spray or treat if you don't know what you're spraying or treating for, because you could be wasting your time, wasting your money, and actually causing more harm. It's always important to know the beneficial insects that you could find in your landscape so that you don't think that you need to kill them. I actually had a phone call once where um, it was, I wasn't sure how to respond. It took me a second. But somebody called and said, help, how do I get caterpillars out of my butterfly garden? And that's one of those things where you need to, you know, understand what it is you're doing. If you're planting a butterfly garden, you have a habitat for butterflies, right? You're going to have host plants that will house the larvae, which are caterpillars. And if you want butterflies later, you have to let the caterpillars eat a little bit or you won't have the butterflies later. So making sure you know what you've kind of set yourself up for is important. So prevention is another great way to help keep your lawn um, and landscape nice and fresh. So you want to look at plants before you buy them and don't bring home plants that have pests on them. And when you do bring home plants, it's always a good idea to quarantine them away for a little bit to check to make sure you didn't miss something. So, you know, a week or so away from the mass amount of your plants is usually safer so that things don't go spreading everywhere. Just remember to water it because it'll be away from everything else. Okay. You can, again, select the plants that are best adapted to your yard. That's that right plant, right place. So if you have the right plant, right place, they're healthier, they're less stressed, they're less susceptible to pests and diseases. Okay. Select resistant varieties. So select something that's been bred to, you know, not be impacted by certain um, common pests and diseases for it. Avoid plants that you know have problems. For example, um, flowering dogwood has a lot of problems in this part of Florida. When people ask me if they, you know, what trees to plant, that is not one of the things I put on a list for them just because of how many issues they can have. American holly also has a surprisingly large amount of issues in the area. You always want to properly install and maintain your plants as well because properly installed and maintained plants are better established and better adapted to um, helping to prevent pest issues by themselves. So cultural practices that you can have are, again, maintaining those healthy plants. Take out plants that are overly stressed or if they're really starting to decline, it's better to take them out and then, you know, put a nice healthy new plant in. Sometimes trying to bring a plant back to, back to health just isn't going to work. It's going to be more um, trouble than it's worth. So again, right plant, right place, proper irrigation, correct installation, all of those are going to help to reduce the chances of issues um, within your garden. You can use biological control, so attracting beneficial insects. Um, avoid using harmful, harmful broad spectrum pesticides. You want to kind of use more targeted approaches when you actually do need to do something. And we already talked about food and nectar and different layers. You can physically remove pests. Like I mentioned, shop vacuuming up the eastern lovers. 
You can use, um, if you have a more controlled area, you can use sticky traps as well. So if you have your own little greenhouse, a sticky trap can work. Um, and you can do little different barriers. So if some of your pests are in the soil, you can do different barriers within the soil to try to um, exclude the pests. Chemical controls, they can, they're usually last resort. Um, and those are chemicals that are not really insecticidal soap and neem oil. Those are things that you can use earlier on. Um, they're less harmful. Uh, they do tend to uh, go with whatever you spray them on. But once you spray them something can, and it dries, something can land and it's not going to kill them. So insecticidal soaps and um, neem oil is good for that. Never spray anything on a plant during the heat of the day um, because you can actually end up cooking your plants. And a quick note about insecticidal soaps, when you're mixing them, don't use detergents. You want to use soap, not detergent. So a detergent like Dawn is a degreaser and removes wax. So if you pour that on a leaf, it's going to help strip the waxy cuticle and it could lead to burning later on. All right, recycling your waste. So you can recycle your lawn waste, do composting, and then that also allows you to put the nutrients from your lawn back into your lawn. So it's a really great thing to do. There's lots of different ways to compost, and if you compost correctly, there should be no smell. So really anybody should be able to compost in their own yard. You can leave your grass clippings on your lawn because they'll naturally decompose. And then it also helps to prevent them from going down storm drains and causing issues in our water bodies too. So you want to reduce, reduce that stormwater runoff. We've talked a bit about it, so let's talk a little bit more specific on things you can do here. So that rain is going to wash away. It's going to grab the fertilizers. It's going to grab oils. It's going to grab debris, and it's going to go into systems. Now, if you have something coming from a drain pipe, it's referred to as point source pollution if that drain pipe goes back to a single location. If that drain pipe goes back to a road that has multiple houses draining into it, that's referred to as non-point source pollution. And that's really one of the major issues with water quality in Florida because it's much harder to regulate when it's coming from a huge area. Um, whereas if you have it coming, you know, a pipe coming from a business, you know that if that water is not good, you can find the business. But if it's coming from a large area, it's better to educate people for better practices than it is to try to go out and you know police people and exactly what they're doing. So some things you can do to reduce stormwater runoff. I mentioned rain barrels earlier. That's a great one. Um, you can also do something like this where you're going to be um, putting things into a cistern or putting them down into a filtration system. Okay. So you can also have rain gardens, we've mentioned already. Um, porous surfaces rather than solid surfaces. So if you can put bricks in rather than solid concrete, that allows rain to go down into the soil more, um, especially if you do kind of like a brick and gravel combination. And you can direct downspouts and gutters towards those porous areas so they can go down and the water can actually stay in your landscape rather than run away. Most homeowners won't do something like this um, specifically, but you can. You can actually create swales um, to catch rainwater so then it can catch there and sit. And that's a case where if you're doing that, a rain garden could be another um, good location, an option for that location as well. So always remember you're irrigating your landscape, not the concrete. The concrete's not gonna grow, right? If you water concrete, you're not gonna like sprout buildings out of it. That would be really cool, but that's not really gonna happen. So you wanna make sure that you relatively regularly actually go through and recalibrate your watering system. And then also make sure that your um, sprinkler heads are going where they need to go. Um, so when you're calibrating your lawn system, you put basically, about 10 cans of like tuna size cans. So you just want about two inches tall, straight sides. You put them out, you turn on your water for 15 minutes, you go out, you measure the depth in the cans. Um, and then you see basically how much water do you have versus how much water you need. So if you turn your water on for 15 minutes and you get a half an inch of water, you know that you need your water on for 15 minutes for your lawn if your lawn requires a half an inch at every watering interval. If you have more questions about how to do that, you're welcome to email me and I will walk you through um, that and get you more information. 
So here's an example of um, a type of rain garden. You can also come to our discovery garden. We have a rain garden example here. Um, and you can look at different ways that you can install a rain garden to help collect in areas that are low in your own personal yard. Our last topic for today is protecting the waterfront. And this pretty much reviews everything that we've gone over, right? People in Florida live no more than 60 miles from an ocean. So we're really connected to our natural environment more so than maybe some other locations because we have so much water, we have so much wildlife, and we are the third most ecologically diverse state in the country. Um, and we might be the most diverse per area because we're smallest. So Texas and California are above us in diversity, but they're also much larger. So we're significantly smaller and have a huge amount of diversity. So it's important to always know your watershed. And the watershed is basically the lowest point all the water is going to drain to in your area. So it might be a lake that's a terminal lake. It might be, um, you might be going into the ocean directly. So if you're draining into a river, that's going to one of our oceans or another lake or potentially both. So it's always good to have an idea of where your water goes. Um, and whatever water management district you're in kind of also helps you know where your water is ultimately going. So a few other reminders, you want that 10 foot buffer zone between your landscape and the shoreline. And what that does is it helps to absorb nutrients, it provides habitat for wildlife, it prevents erosion. Um, and again, you're keeping things from going into the lake that you don't want. And you, if you live on a lake, you want the lake to be beautiful, right? So this is a way to make sure that that lake stays beautiful so that you can safely go out and enjoy um, the water on, during recreation. You do want to remove exotics, but you need to check with local regulations for removals. Some locations don't want you to remove anything. Others are okay with you removing things. So in Lake County, you can always um, contact lakes and stormwaters and they um, can help you know exactly what to do. Right? And then you can plant back native shoreline plants that help not only the environment, but also the um, aquatic zones too. And with that, we've got about nine minutes left. So at this point, you should have a basic understanding of the nine Florida friendly landscape principles and have some ideas of how you can use it in your landscape. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask if you have any questions. I'm also gonna post a link to the post test, or not, it's not a test, it's a post survey for the class so we can see if um, you learned anything. And um, yeah, that's it. So if you have any questions, put them in the chat now. And I am here for you. This, uh, this post survey should also take 